Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Lambeau channel. Way back in 2013, then-CEO of Ripple, Chris Larson, talked about the end of Ripple distributing XRP, because eventually it will all be out in the wild. Now, um, Ripple's distribution plan ultimately, many years later, led to the conspiracy theory of escrowed XRP being secretly set aside for central banks all over the world known as the pre-allocation theory. And so there's been discussion in the community about this, which I think stems from this video uh, from XRP community member JV. So uh, JV, if you're watching, shout out and credit to you. Thank you very much for sharing this. I do appreciate it. Got some very interesting uh, conversation flowing here. And there are two separate clips, each about two minutes long. And I, I did transcribe uh, portions that I found to be most interesting from uh, both of those videos I do want to talk about. Uh, but this does date back to, for the best of my understanding, 2013, because there's a moment in the video where he cites that um, XRP was set at 100 billion, so that would be the creation of XRP. Um, and he said one year and two months ago. Well, I know that happened in June of 2012, so that should put it towards, you know, the second half of 2013. So uh, basically about nine years ago, I, I know JV wrote flashback eight years ago. Um, if I'm taking Chris Larson at his word, though, my suspicion is it's actually nine. Not that it matters that much, but I just thought I'd mention it. Um, but, you know, XRP's original distribution has always been its great, its original sin, if you will. But I don't think it's going to matter in the end because ultimately, like, let's say Bitcoin and XRP both are long-term viable. Well, eventually all Bitcoin's going to be mined. Eventually Ripple is going to hold almost no XRP if they truly do continue to distribute as they've indicated they're going to. And at that point, once once 100% uh, or about 100% of both of these cryptocurrencies are out in the wild, being used however people want to use them, what the hell mattered is it in terms of how they were initially distributed? The, 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 the origin will not matter whatsoever, but the origin of Bitcoin being distributed via mining resulted in a significant setback in terms of adoption, in terms of actual utility. Bitcoin, it's being speculated upon, it's a store value, fine, okay, but what else can it do? Lightning Network barely functions at this point. You know, try doing a transaction over $200. Not going to work. Not in 2022. And maybe that works in the future. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I'm just saying, after all this time, it doesn't do anything. But Ripple, um, you know, and the way that they're going to market is completely different. The way that XRP is designed is completely different. And as a result, with the consensus mechanism that XRP has, you don't have the slow transactions. You don't have the costly transactions and the high energy use. So I want to share with you some thoughts on here and break down some more on this pre-allocation stuff. But before going further, I do want to be clear, I do not have a financial background of any kind. I am not offering financial advice. And you definitely should not buy or sell anything because of anything I say or write. I'm just an enthusiast who enjoys making YouTube videos about crypto-related topics, but just as a hobby and just for fun. Now, um, I do want to mention this very briefly. I've brought this up a handful of times over the years. Um, this is a Ripple Insights piece, so this is their Ripple's official blog series. This is written by Brad Garlinghouse on May 16th, 2017, over five years ago. And uh, this is titled, Ripple to place 55 billion XRP in escrow to ensure certainty of total XRP supply. And, and we know at the tail end of 2017, that happened, that, that, that XRP was placed in escrow, but that's not the reason I pulled this up. Within this Ripple Insights piece, there is an XRP distribution curve. It's on your screen right now. I've never seen an updated version of this, so the numbers presumably would have changed to some degree because real life has happened since then. But you can see even back in 2017, they were, they were plotting out a 30-year distribution plan um, for, for XRP. And it hasn't gone exactly as you would have expected based on, you know, maybe they were a little bit ambitious in terms of how much would have gotten out of the point. But the, the idea here being that Ripple understands at some point in the future, they're not going to hold that much XRP. That has always been part of the plan. And, and Chris Larson, I transcribed it, so I'm going to share it with you. Chris Larson was talking about how... Uh, you know, Ripple holding as much XRP as they, they hold, it's just going to be a temporary thing. And they have been releasing XRP out into the wild, but, you know, in terms of how much gets out and how quickly, well, that depends on how big the, uh, you know, quickly a crypto asset class grows, because XRP moves in tandem with the rest of the market. And if you put out too great a percentage of XRP based on volume over a specific time period, all you're going to do is crater price. And that's not going to be good for anybody in terms of adoption and confidence in XRP and long-term viability. That would just look like dumping on the market. And Ripple really, really, really doesn't want to do that. And they've demonstrated that for a decade now. So um, given that's that's the case here, again, uh, 
we don't know exactly when it'll be the point where all or almost 100% of XRP will be out of the hands of, X, uh, of Ripple, but that's the direction that it's going. That's always been part of the plan. And so I don't, I don't buy into this whole stupid original sin, you know, idea that Bitcoin maxis like to throw at us in the XRP community, you know, just because it wasn't mined, it's some sort of terrible thing. No, no, no. That's, that's like cult speak as far as I'm concerned, because there are Bitcoin maxis that say anything that doesn't use proof of work, um, is it's just a scam. It's, it's, it's not reputable. This is that. And it's just, it's just nonsense. It's complete and utter nonsense. We're talking about computer code here and XRP and XP ledger. It is obviously decentralized. Uh, and so there was this video from my fellow XRP YouTuber, Brad Kimes, and uh, part of the title read as follows. This is from just yesterday. Uh, Ripple Chris Larson, pre-allocation confirmed. So we shared this video clip, and I'm going to share these a couple transcribed portions here. And um, he believes that this is a confirmation of his pre-allocation theory. And there are a couple parts to this, because part of his pre-allocation theory um, is not remotely divisive. And part of his XRP pre-allocation theory is highly divisive, I think it's fair to say, within the XRP community. And so this is not an attack on Brad at all. I just love sharing ideas. And um, the way I'm looking at this is a bit different than his. And so I'm just going to push back on his idea. So I'll challenge his idea, but uh, not, uh, you know, criticizing him as a person. This is not intended to be rude or anything like that. I just think it's fun to, you know, have uh, opposing ideas, you know, come out so we can just talk about this stuff. Because to me, it's fun to share ideas. So just, just be super duper crystal clear here. But let me share with you first what Chris Larson had to say here. And so, again, I think this was in 2013. That's my best guess. And the host here said, so, Chris, how do you plan on... Oh, I need to mention this, too. Back in the day, Ripple and, and, and XRP were used interchangeably to describe what today is just known as XRP. Um, I know it was confusing back then, but in the earliest of days, I mean, hell, <laughs> when XRP was created, Ripple, well, Ripple didn't exist, but even when Ripple did exist, they were called OpenCoin and NewCoin before they ended up becoming Ripple Labs and then ended up doing business as Ripple. So, <laughs> um, you know, it was a little convoluted. And I think if they could go back, they'd probably, you know, set things up in such a way name wise where there wouldn't be such confusion, but it is what it is. And so when, when they cite Ripple here, uh, a lot of the time, they actually are talking about XRP, and you can figure that out through context. I just wanted to mention that. But today, it's completely unacceptable in 2022 to use Ripple and XRP interchangeably. They absolutely are not. And we needed to have that distinction. So it's a, it's a good evolution here. So the host said, So Chris, how do you plan on distributing Ripple? I know part of it is set aside for the founders, and the rest is given out basically to encourage people to use Ripple. And Chris Larson, then CEO, said... Yeah, so we have a different confirmation method, consensus. We don't have the requirement to have to reimburse transaction validators with new XRP. Obviously, in Bitcoin, because the electricity and the computing power, the protocol has to reimburse validators with new Bitcoin. That's why there is the mining method in Bitcoin. You sort of have to have it that way. With Ripple, you don't have to have it that way. We could have chosen to have a mining system, but our belief is that we would better, uh, we would be better to funnel that money back into Ripple Labs, keep Ripple Labs well funded, so that we can keep hiring incredible cryptographers and engineers who can increasingly improve the protocol. So let's pause right there. That's the same story that I heard when I jumped into crypto in 2017. It's the same thing that they're being transparent about today. They have a bunch of XRP. The plan is to use it, and they have been using it to fund XRP so, or to fund Ripple. So either you have a problem with that and maybe you didn't invest in XRP as a result or you, you're like me and maybe you don't care and maybe you don't have as big a trust issues as some of these Bitcoin maxis out there and maybe you're like, yeah, I don't care. Maybe I could get burned. You know, they could start dumping on the market. Okay, maybe that happens, but yeah, you know, it's, it's fine. I, I think that our, you know, our incentives are aligned effectively because they're the largest holders of XRP and they've got all the incentive in the world to continue to, you know, push for a thriving XRP ecosystem, which to this point, they cert certainly have. I think that's pretty damn undis ind indisputable here. Um, so yeah, so again, that last sentence here, uh, yeah, it was about the cryptographers and engineers that went higher. And then Larson says, that's actually good for everybody. The second part is since we don't have to distribute it to validators, Ripple Labs can give it to business development partners, to consumers broadly, and to people globally. Now, I'll pause to note, that is what they have done. Um, they developed their Spring initiative, which ended up being rebranded as Ripple X. And I understand the functionality has changed somewhat to some degree, but it's basically the, the development arm of Ripple and money has been given 
uh, to people that they think would uh, foster development, certainly within the world of the ecosystem of XRP, but some a little bit more broadly crypto, because, you know, a better, bigger, you know, successful crypto space is great for XRP too. So that's the direction they went. And then the earliest of days, it is true that they had the plan to give XRP out to consumers, and they did that. They never sold to consumers, but they did give uh, XRP away for free. But that model changed quickly because once XRP was being traded, all that would happen is people would get it for free and then they could just dump it on the market. And so that rendered the whole model completely useless. So they quit doing that. That's how old this interview is. You know, they hadn't even gotten to the point where they were really broadly giving away <laughs> XRP to that point. Um, anyway, and then uh, Larson continues. So two things we've been doing that, uh, which we like, is we've been incentivizing market makers with XRP for givable loans. That's essentially the vehicle we've been using. So I'll pause to note here. I don't know exactly what the structure of that would be, but that sounds similar to some of what they've done, only in the sense that um, Ripple um, has given sweetheart deals to some customers, and we're not privy to all the specifics of that, but it could be monetary compensation. It could be uh, discounted rates for XRP. There have been things like that, and that's the kind of jumpstart this particular ecosystem, which is very common in business. When you're trying to get a new technology or idea or concept adopted, it providing incentives to customers is very normal. And so they have done that. Now, in, in terms of, you know, this idea of for, forgivable loans, I don't know the specifics of that. I can't speak to that. That was back in 2013. That doesn't sound quite like anything that they're doing now. I know they offer a line of credit, uh, but, you know, there's an interest that is actually paid on that. And so there's been an evolution here, obviously. So I just wanted to note that. Um, and then he says, we feel that incentives, uh, we, we feel that incentivizes big currency traders, high frequency traders to actually be active market makers on Ripple. That provides liquid markets. That's good for everybody. Gives them an incentive in the long-term success of the network. In some ways, just exactly what Visa did is they gave out ownership of Visa to key banks to participate in the system. We think that's good. So let's pause and note there. Uh, and I've talked about this before. When credit card companies were uh, becoming a thing, I think it might have been MasterCard. They may have initially, if memory serves, I think it was them, that were paying their merchant customers um, to actually um, you know, conduct transactions utilizing credit. So in other words, they get paid to push for the adoption of credit cards. I heard stuff like that. And here Chris Larson's talking about Visa specifically, giving out ownership of Visa to key banking partners to kind of bootstrap the system. So stuff like this happens, again, in the world of business all the time. This is not uncommon. You give sweetheart deals, and then once you've got an ecosystem thriving, it's no longer necessary to offer the sweetheart deals. Normal stuff. Really, truly normal stuff here, right? Um, now, of course, as we'll get into in just a minute here, that doesn't mean that back in the earliest of years, Ripple had pre-allocated, as Brad Kimes has asserted, um, XRP to be held by central banks the world over, which to me, um, it, it just, it's, it's an idea. I, I don't see how it would make sense for, for that to have occurred. I don't see how it could have occurred when in the earliest of years, XRP was one of a number of cryptocurrencies. There's way more today, fine, but there were still a number of cryptocurrencies even back then. Uh, it wasn't even clear if the crypto asset class was going to persist, if it was going to exist. There was almost no liquidity in XRP. It was worth about half a penny each. Very low market cap. Almost nothing. And even Ripple didn't know how they were going to go to market with XRP. But we're supposed to believe that in those earliest of years, when even Ripple didn't know um, how they could potentially utilize XRP, when there are a, a number of uh, cryptocurrencies competing, we're supposed to believe that while that all was happening that there were secret arrangements made to pre-allocate Ripple's XRP holdings specifically for central banks, and we're supposed to believe all that based on literally zero evidence. To me, that doesn't make sense. I know that's what Brad Kimes has asserted over the years, dating back to 2019. I respectfully disagree. I don't, I don't think that makes sense. I think it's a fringe idea, uh, but I don't say that to be mean or attack him. I'm challenging his idea because I, I, we need to be able to do that. And he can tell me that my idea is wrong, and that's, that's fine. As long as everything's done you know, in, with, through civil discourse, like that's how it should be. But I'm just trying to articulate why I'm I'm coming at this the way that I am here, um, and so let me actually go through a little bit of this now, and then I'll jump back to some of what Chris Larson had to say after this. There was this clip shared by my fellow XRP YouTuber Crypto Eddie, and it was a clip where um, we got to a question and a, a question and answer segment 
in an interview that, um, or maybe just maybe you could consider it a panel. There's, there's a host and there's a couple others. David Schwartz was there. David Schwartz, of course, Ripple CTO, co-creator of the XRP Ledger. And he was asked about, uh, you know, the, effectively a pre-allocation, uh, you know, the theories of XRP and, you know, that just XRP, be, um, the XRP escrow Ripple has, you know, in 2020, you know, being four banks. And so this was a couple years ago when David Schwartz was saying this. And David Schwartz said, quote, those conspiracy theories don't have any grounding, end quote. So even David Schwartz already put this whole thing to bed. So it's amazing to me that we're still talking about pre-allocation. Um, now, if you just mean pre <laughs> and I'm going to get into this in just a minute here. The reason that there's confusion and in some cases uh, dispute over whether or not pre-allocation is a thing is because people are using different definitions to describe what pre-allocation is. So, so check this out. There was a part of a thread, it's on your screen here, between Crypto Eddie and another XRP community member. The XRP community member in question seemed to find the pre-allocation theory compelling. I personally don't. And so I, I jumped in and I, I wrote the following. Um, Kimes has used the term he created, pre-allocation, in at least two ways. Number one, to describe contracts Ripple has with customers regarding XRP sales. And number two, to describe a secret plan that's in motion for Ripple's escrowed XRP to end up in the hands of central banks the world over. Regarding point number one, no one disputes this. Of course, Ripple has customer contracts and we're not aware of all of them. No need to make up the term pre-allocation to describe this, but he can't. So let's pause to expand upon that a little bit. Part of the time when he, when Brad Kimes says pre-allocation, he's talking about something that nobody disputes. And so when people dispute him on Twitter, and, and I've seen DAI do this as well, they'll come back with, well, here's proof that pre-allocation is real. And then they'll just cite Ripple contracts. I'm like, well, no, that's not, that, that's not what they're disputing. That part we all agree on. Of course, there are Ripple contracts, and we're not privy to all the specifics and all the deals and who they're with and if they're with banks or any of that stuff. We're not privy to that. That's not conspiracy stuff. That's very normal stuff. That's fine to talk about. Perfectly reasonable. Not remotely fringe. But the second point is the one that is divisive. And so I wrote the following. The, uh, the second point is a conspiracy theory with zero evidence. I think a lot of time people talk past one another because everyone seems to have a different definition of what pre-allocation is. That's because Kimes has used it to describe multiple things. Point number one is not disputed. Point number two is highly divisive within the XRP community. Regarding the conspiracy theory, I don't know why people even want this. Would it not be more desirable to have more XRP in the hands of regular people rather than almost all of it in the hands of government all over the world? So let's pause to, th pause to think about this. Like right now, uh, you know, SWIFT comprises a, a huge portion of the correspondent banking system, right? It's gigantic, over 11,000 banks and financial institutions. So what's going to happen now? So, X, so governments are going to come along. They're going to have a bunch of XRP. And then because of that, the government's holding XRP is going to result in SWIFT not existing anymore? Like, like So the governments, because the governments, they're going to come in and fill the role that SWIFT does. They're going to, they're going to facilitate the, the settlement. And they're going to provide the liquidity. So they're going to provide the settlement mechanism for for the world. And that's going to make sense for governments to do how? And what's that going to do to the market price of XRP? And it, it's just, it, it, and you could go on in this down this line of thought. I just, I don't see how any of this would even make logical sense anyway, or how it would be desirable for people in the XRP community. Like, we want this? Like, there's been a secret deal in, the, in place for almost a decade, and we want this? I'm not so sure of that. And then I wrote... Regarding Kimes' video from the other day, so I'm talking about his YouTube video I highlighted earlier. Regarding Kimes' video the other day, he compared apples to oranges while also delving into the fringe. He compared a centralized company giving away tokens to Ripple giving away XRP decentralized to governments around the world, central banks. And here's what I'm talking about. Um, he mashed up the, the clip that JV shared with a clip of Gary Gensler speaking in fall of 2018. He was teaching a course at MIT, and he mashed these two clips together as if they were apples and apples, but they're apples and oranges is the thing here. Uh, so part of what he shared was what I already highlighted, where Chris Larson was highlighting 
that um, you know Visa had shared or, or given away some ownership in order to like kind of bootstrap that ecosystem with credit cards in the earliest of days. And then he talked about Gary Ginsler. Gary Ginsler is this this quote where he was talking about, and it was a very small portion of what he was talking about. It's very selective. Where Gary Ginsler was saying uh, something to the effect of, you know, maybe uh, you give up if you're a bank or something to that effect, you give up you know, a certain portion of the ownership if you want to bootstrap an ecosystem. Uh, maybe, could, and he's talking about a blockchain here, mind you, and then he says, maybe there's a token and you give them ownership of the token. And so he uses that to justify this idea of pre-allocation. The problem is, if you listen to the whole thing in context and he didn't provide the whole thing, which goes on for like a couple minutes or so, and you can check it, uh, it's, it's I, I provided the link here, and uh, it's at the 56 minute mark. You can watch it yourself. I took a screen grab. That's what's on your screen here. This was a screen grab from Gary Gensler's MIT course. And this is the portion that uh, that was chopped out by Brad, Brad, Brad Kimes. But I highlighted this, you know, the relevant portion in this red box. Here's the bullet point. Can permission to blockchain adequately address use case? And so if you listen to the whole thing, it was actually Gary Gensler talking about um, the idea of a new central authority coming in to supplant the existing central authority, basically like in the world of banking. That, that's pretty much it. So he's talking about a, a blockchain. And at first, when he started talking about a blockchain, he didn't even state that there would be a coin attached to it because you can have blockchain technology without a cryptocurrency attached to it. And then he said, but then he said, of course, you know, and he did make this point, you know, that the incumbents, you know, they don't really want somebody new to come in. So if you want to kind of bootstrap that system, and I'm paraphrasing here now, then uh, there's you could give away some ownership. Or if there's a token, you can give away ownership of the token. Now, mind you, we're talking about a centralized token, not a decentralized thing like XRP that has an open market price. So that means that it would have to be backed by something. Presumably, it would be backed by the dollar or, or whatever fiat currency, right? That's typically how that would work. That is very different. But they were talking about permissioned blockchains that it's on your screen right here can permissioned blockchains adequately address use case that was the topic of conversation very different than this idea of ripple giving away xrp to central banks to me these are dots that it does not make sense to connect um and here's another slide i, I took the screen grab from his speech is that uh, 56 minutes and, uh, and six seconds it's gary Ginsler, and he said and how can you actually jumpstart broad adoption again it's for a centralized system very different. And so to me, to see, you know, you know Brad Kimes, he was, you know, pairing the Chris Larson video with this and then talking about pre-allocation. I just don't think that those things really deserve to go together. I don't think that really actually makes sense personally. Um, so I just respectfully disagree there. And then um, the host, going back to this video here, the host said, I think the biggest criticism I've heard of Ripple is why should I trust if it's not centralized, if it's centrally controlled? Uh, why should, yeah, let me, I, I missed a word in there. Let me just reread that sentence. I think the biggest criticism I've heard of Ripple is why should I trust it if it's not centralized, if it's centrally controlled? I understood the protocol is decentralized and all that, but Ripple Labs, correct me if I'm wrong, controls, controls the disbursement of the Ripple and could potentially modify the money supply and things like that. And here's what Larson said. It's a great question. Probably a few key things people frequently misunderstand. Just like Bitcoin, Ripple Labs, the founders, we can never create new XRP. That's set. It was set at 100 billion about a year and two months ago. It was set in the ledger, and that's in the protocol, just like Bitcoin. And then there was a break in the transcript, and Larson says, in our distribution of XRP, which is a short-term thing that will run its course, it's kind of the initial distribution. The objective is how do you, th you bring as many market makers, gateways, marketplaces, bridges, partners, as many consumers as you can, as many hosted wallets as you can, and we think that's actually a really great tool that Ripple Labs has to add value. And, and I will say this, and I actually take issue with part of what Chris Larson said, the initial distribution in crypto uh, is the initial movement. Once it's gone from the initial holder to a holder that was not the initial holder, then it's been distributed. Ripple was not the initial distributor. And so back then he was looking at it as though they were, but just in terms of how, how we talk about this stuff in 2022, no, Ripple's not the distributor. So, and that's why I take issue with what's considered to be XRP in circulating supply. You go to live coin watch, you go to coin market cap. It says X amount of, uh, you know, uh, 
XRP is is actually in circulation and they're not including ripples, even though they don't treat the rest of crypto like that. Once it's moved from the uh, whoever actually created it to whatever the entity or person, but once it's out from the creator, then they consider it to be in circulation, but they don't do that on live coin watch and coin market cap with XRP. That's the one exception they're making. And they just decided, well, I can only imagine what they're thinking. Well, because it's so much and they're closely related to the initial uh, creator of, of, of XRP. So we're just not going to count that. Okay. Well, it's your platform. You can do whatever you want. I'm just saying, uh, I, I can have my own opinion too then. And my perspective is that it is in circulating supply because it's out. And circulating supply also, mind you, does not mean that it's available for sale on exchange. Some people falsely think that. It just means that it's out in the wild. Just like my XRP I have in cold storage, that's in circulation even though I'm not, it's not for sale. I'm not, my XRP is not for sale. It's in circulation. So is, is what it is here. You all let me know what you think here. And again, um, no disrespect what for what's over to Brad Kimes. I think it's fun to talk about this stuff. I just strongly disagree with him in this pre-allocation stuff. I also don't think that he needs, needs to use the word pre-allocation to describe ripple contracts. They're just ripple contracts with customers. You don't need to create a new term to describe that. And it's muddy in the waters for a lot of people because they don't understand that it's just being used interchangeably for like at least two different purposes to describe two different things. But even in his video yesterday, Brad, Brad Crimes was talking about this idea of XRP being pre-allocated for, for different purposes. And let, let me go, actually, you know, let me go a little bit further here too because I also ended up writing, um, governments owning crypto is not a crazy idea. El Salvador owns Bitcoin. But Kimes is on record stating he believes that XRP is currently pre-allocated for central banks and that this fact is being kept secret from us. So let's pause to note, and I did a video that was probably over 50 minutes long a couple months or so ago, and I, I transcribed uh, video clips from Brad Kimes. He literally said that he believes this is the case. So he's on record having stated that. If he no longer believes that, he can, uh, he can state that. But based on what he said in his video yesterday, I think he really does still believe that. Um... <clears throat> But, um, uh, again, it's, you got to break these ideas apart. There are governments, I mean, El Salvador owns Bitcoin. That's not crazy. That's a different idea than thinking that, you know, back in 2013 or in the earlier years that, uh, that there was some sort of thing set in motion so that central banks would take hold of XRP at some point in the future. And if that's true, why don't they just have it right now? Like, why isn't that just happened by now? Is there a reason for that? I've never seen that addressed either. And then I also wrote, there simply is no evidence for that which puts the idea of conspiracy theory territory by, puts the idea in conspiracy theory territory by definition. And I shared this screen grab from Merriam-Webster's dictionary so that you know I'm not using it as a pejorative, I'm using it as it's intended to be used. Uh, because it, it is a fringe idea, it's out there. Look at the definition here. A theory that explains an event or set of circumstances as the result of a secret plot by usually powerful conspirators. So, let's think that's the definition of what Brad Kimes is talking about. These are the most these are the most powerful people on the planet. If you're talking about the governments around the world, central banks, and it's secret and it's been in the works for potentially the better part of a decade, and we don't know about it, that's a conspiracy theory. Here's another definition from Merriam-Webster's: a theory asserting that a secret of great importance is being kept from the public. Well, it sure as hell is. If it's happening, it sure as hell is being kept from us. Um, so I'm not using it as a pejorative. I'm using it. Uh, and some people do use it as a pejorative. That's why I cite that. But it is what it is. And I then wrote, he began saying he believes XRP has been pre-allocated to central banks in 2019 and that it had been pre-allocated many years before that. That's quite a secret if it's been plotted this whole time and strange that David Schwartz would call ideas of this type conspiracy theories. I fail to see why governments the world over have been interested in XRP in the earliest stages of adoption with almost no liquidity at a time when even Ripple didn't quite know how to go to market with it. So, look, I'm not saying that it's impossible or unreasonable to state that perhaps a number of different cryptocurrencies uh, could be held by governments the world over. That is not that is not weird. That's a speculative statement. And if you look up, you know, just what speculation is in the, in the dictionary, I've done that on my channel before too, You'll see that that's what that fall, falls under, speculating that so-and-so might be true. Stating something like this, though, you know, this pre-allocation theory, and, and it's, it's already done, it's in the works, and he believes it, that is conspiracy theory territory. And I don't see, and the reason I'm, I'm pushing back against this is I don't see how you make that leap without evidence. And that's why I, I like my strong belief is that most conspiracy theories 
are just not grounded in reality, no matter the topic in life. That's been my life experience. I'm a 39-year-old man. I think most conspiracy theories are complete and utter garbage. You have some that end up panning out, and okay, fine. But, like, just... Because, like, even if a government ever held XRP in the future, does that mean pre-allocation was true? Because think about this. No, literally, think about this. If a government ever holds XRP in the future, what if the plan's made, like, five years from now, and that's when the plan is made, and then they hold XRP? Is that pre-allocation when Brad Kimes is saying that this has been planned, for, he started talking about it in 2019, but stating that it was planned even years prior to that? So even if a government does hold it, does it mean it's going to be some big secret, and if so, for how long? And is the deal made right now? Right now in 2022, is there a deal we actually don't know about? I am highly skeptical. Highly, highly, highly skeptical of that. Because there's, there's no evidence for it. And so, like, by nature, I'm a skeptic. If I'm going to believe something, you need, to, you need to throw me some evidence, or I need to be able to connect some dots, but there aren't even dots to connect here. Here I just cited that, you know, apples and oranges were being compared effectively. You know, dots being connected that shouldn't be connected. So, that's the way that I'm looking at it. If anybody thinks I'm wrong, I, I'd love to be told I'm wrong if uh, it's done so respectfully, because I do think that conversation on this and friendly debate is actually a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. So that's it. I'll stop blabbering. Those are my thoughts for now. I'm not a financial advisor. You should not buy or sell anything because of anything I say or write. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Until next time, to the moon, Lambo.